Good afternoon, everyone. Um, this afternoon, um, I'm going to be talking to you um, about the UK automotive sector and the opportunity for power electronics within it. So my name is uh, Philippa Oldham um, and I am the Stakeholder Engagement Director for the Advanced Propulsion Centre. Um, power electronics play a crucial role um, in regulating voltage levels and controlling power flow to electric traction motors and enabling plug-in vehicles to charge from the electricity from the grid. With increasing electrification, power electronics will represent an ever higher proportion of value within the vehicle and rapidly growing market opportunity. However, before I delve into some of the detail, I thought that I'd like to give you a little bit of an overview as to who the APC are and where we fit within the ecosystem. So the APC was founded in 2013. Um, and we are here to offer a unique role for the sector. Um, we are here to provide value and a vast amount of opportunity uh, to highlight where there is an, where, where you can um, really invest your technology. Uh, we were formed in 2013 as a joint government and industry partnership um, with a remit of a billion pounds to invest in the transition to net zero technologies for the automotive sector on onboard te technologies. So, Part of that is, is the funding that we do, um, but also about uh, we create insight, which is what I'll be talking to you about, about today. So they are roadmaps looking at the future trajectory of where technology might go. Um, industry challenges, so again, highlighting where innovations are needed um, and research and development can be carried forward right from the early stage through to the later stage research and development. Um, we work with organisations to build consortia to address some of these challenges. So unlike some of the traditional funding um, organisations, we very much work as part of your team to make sure that we're developing the right solution. Uh, the funding is match funded um, and it is to provide those near zero technologies. So what we've achieved um, since 2013 is, is we've supported 170 uh, low carbon projects, worked with over 400 partners. And what that's meant is um, we've managed to, through funding these projects, save around 288 million tonnes of CO2 uh, of the lifetime emissions of these vehicles, uh, created or safeguarded over 50,000 jobs, which in the current marketplace is a really, really important um, agenda item of the government in terms of levelling up and securing those job creation going forward. Um, so so this, is, this is the aim and the ambition of some of the technology. Um, where we fit in the funding landscape, some people find uh, the landscape within the, within, um, the UK quite difficult to navigate. So this slide hopefully gives you a, a little bit more context. Um, so you will know, you'll be familiar probably with um, EPSRC and Innovate. So they very much uh, cover the front, the front end, so that early stage research and development and proof of concept. And where the APC come into play is that application readiness. Um, so that's through our collaborative research and development programmes uh, as I've just discussed, um, and also uh, the Automotive Transformation Fund, which is very much looking at industrialising of scale. So in 2020, uh, the government around 450 million to help support investment in capital. So, so far we've seen uh, bene beneficiary uh, organisations such as AESC and Vision with their partnership with Nissan uh, in Sunderland to the expansion of their gigafactory up there, and also uh, British Bolt. Uh, with their announcement in their gigafactory. So support from that. So that's really working with the supply chain to understand where some of those capital investments um, are needed to support the growth of UK industry and UK manufacturing. However, we do work closely uh, with other uh, industrial strategy partners and other funding organisations. So uh, a three highlighted here. So the Faraday Battery Challenge, um, who obviously are uh, supporting the development of batteries, uh, driving the electric revolution, which is probably more relevant to this audience. So they obviously cover off uh, innovation and research um, in terms of uh, power electronics, machines and drives. And then finally, the Made Smarter um, initiative, which has obviously got uh, an activity running in the northeast, looking at how we improved uh, information through that manufacturing process and making it more, uh, making the UK more competitive by use of some of those digital tools. So um, 
Back in, um, I think, 2020, um, our technology trends team uh, at the Advanced Propulsion Centre did some research looking at what is the opportunity around electrification for the passenger car market. And actually, one of the things that we found is that there was a £24 billion um, opportunity uh, in terms of growth around this area, of which £10 billion uh, is related to power electronics. So during the course of this presentation, I'm going to tell, tell you a little bit more about uh, how that fits into play. But for, before we start um, creating some of this, in, this insight and development, we need to work with um, industry and academia to look at how do we really set the right performance indicators to make sure what we're saying is, is useful to industry and actually representative of, of the current marketplace. So. Um, here, I'd like to uh, talk to you a little bit about this graph. Um, I believe the slides will be available after the after the show, so please look at these in more details. But you'll see on the graph on the left hand side that there are sort of three shaded areas. So the the light green represents uh, the light duty vehicles, um, which is less than three and a half tons, so including sort of light light um, vans as well. Uh, the blue is buses and coaches, and then the grey is more the heavy goods side of it, or anything greater than three and a half tons, um, and includes off highway, so the agricultural side of it. And what we've tried to do is look at this in terms of the energy power spectrum. Um, so this, all the sector, all sectors need to think about when they're designing systems is, is that energy power just spectrum. Um, propulsion systems are very much tailored to specific power and energy demands um, and based on their user case and, and duty cycle. So this, this sort of presents the outline of the mass market project projects, products, sorry. Um, However, you'll see also on the graph that there are three numbers, one, two and three, um, which the detail is on the right hand side. So really what this represents is area one um, is showing areas that are often high volume and cost effective. And uh, slide two is in shows the high high performance and power dense. So this is often the high performance cars, buses and, and medium duty vehicles. And point three represents um, the high power densities needed, but they are really for efficiency and to maximize the energy use uh, that the vehicle will need. So a lot of the usage uh, related to duty cycles, so hence the relation to um, 44 ton uh, vehicles. Moving on to the next slide. Um, so here, uh, what we've done is tried to do a, a spider diagram or radar diagram, as, as some of you may know it as. And again, this is just sort of re-emphasizing what I've just talked about in terms of the energy and power outputs from the previous slide. So again, you can see uh, item one very much looks more at those low cost, high, high volume areas uh, with the emphasis in that area. Uh, number two looks at uh, the power density side of it. So very much those high performance vehicles um, and, and some of those uh, buses and, and duty cycles that they have to go through. And then finally, um, point three, which is around efficiency prioritization, which as you would expect, it would be our haulage guys and those guys on the off highway and heavy uh, off highway uh, working the fields long hours to make sure that um, the vehicles are delivering uh, their, their requirements and the performance needed. Next, um, I'd like to talk about the technology indicators. So these were, again, based from looking at um, where we are in terms of the current direction of travel. And it's looking at best in class um, and addressing uh, cost and performance metrics. So they are ambitious, but they are um, where industry should target their um, innovations and their, their research and development. So really, um, if you if you look at the top there, we've got the uh, inverters. So this is where we're converting uh, DC provided by the onboard battery pack to AC um, for suitable for operating the electric motor, for example. We then have some uh, key indicators and on the timelines out to 2035 of the DC to DC converters. So this is very much looking at um, taking the uh, the DC uh, output voltage for the lower power ancillaries um, such as your infotainment system in your vehicles and the lighting systems potentially that you have within the vehicles and finally um, the single phase and the onboard charging piece uh, out again in the same timeline so this is how do you take that um, alternating current that is provided by the mains grid and then convert it to be to dc to be suitable for recharging the battery pack so 
this timeline gives you sort of when they were met in 2020, out to 2025, 25, and then out to 2035 um, to really sort of set those boundaries. So moving on uh, to the roadmap itself, um, you can see here, um, this is the trajectory. Again, these will be shared in more detail. But what we try to do with these roadmaps um, is break them down into sort of key areas of focus uh, on the left hand side uh, within the within the domain and based on what the experts were telling us. So you've got your semiconductors, your components, um, your converters and then life cycle, which is a feature actually within all the roadmaps across the technology areas. Um, and what it does, it takes where the current status is and looks at the developments that need to happen out to 2040 and beyond uh, if we're going to achieve this. So for a little bit more detail for this session, um, I'm going to break down each of each of these um, and give you a bit more insight in terms of what the roadmap is telling us uh, for future trajectory. So first of all, I'm going to start with semiconductors. So semiconductors um, has four streams there. You can see the, the four different channels there. Um, and I think, you know, one of the key things here uh, is the first one is, is optimizing the semiconductor devices. Um, these are improving all the time and, and um, we're seeing smaller chips develop the time and all the time and thinner wafers. But the first point uh, is that second stream. Um, and that is looking at the silicon carbide materials. So currently, um, industry is sort of developing uh, six inch wafers, but uh, we are looking obviously at ramping that up to eight inch wa wafers. Um, and what this does is it will lead to rapid cost reduction. Um, and we're also seeing that, well, these, are, these uh, six inch wafers were first introduced by the likes of the Tesla Model 3 and Hyundai. Um, and so we're looking at how we can develop those. And then obviously the trajectory is that one day we might get to the 12 inch wafers and obviously that is in primarily in, in some of the research activities at the lower end of the TRL level at the moment. The next stream, uh, the third stream that I was going to talk about is around gallium nitride materials. So these are extremely hard to manufacture at the moment, but very much support those onboard chargers and those DDCC converters. So again, something that we'll see going forward and actually I think that we will see a, a higher ramp up. We're seeing more technology coming through um, in this area um, that are coming through from Innovate UK and discussions are happening for some of our, uh, our CR&D projects where companies are wanting to use this technology um, going forward. And then finally is the um, ultra wideband gap materials. Um, so those that are in lab stage development at the moment in terms of the materials and these will provide um, higher performance characteristics, which is where we en want to end up. Um, however, we believe that um, from the discussions with the experts that the initial applications of these uh, materials will be outside of the automotive sector due to the price constraints. But as they ramp up in, in volume, we'll obviously expect to see the economies of scale start to come down and the price become more competitive and then them being started to be absorbed into probably some of the more um, higher end luxury class vehicles um, until the, the price drops more significantly. But again, expectation is that won't be until sort of the late 2030s um, into the early 2040s. So moving on, um, you move on to uh, the, the components, the component part of the um, the roadmap. So this is sort of the second stream that you can look at. Um, and this is uh, looking at the component areas. So first of all, um, picking up where the number one is on the passive components. Now, these will be, need to be developed alongside the wideband gap material. So um, hence they're in, in development. But what it means is they can operate at higher temperatures and have higher um, switching frequencies. So this is um, me that, that, that again, the performance will be better out of them uh, in the longer term, um, but it does require that joint um, initiative and, and that joint development. Um, the second aspect of it is the semiconductor packaging. So we need better integration really to get better performance. And again, these will expect to see uh, going forward to get higher temperatures out of the, of the vehicles and converted um, topologies to get better performance uh, from these. And again, a number of uh, projects working on this area going forward. Then I'm going to touch on um, the converters part of the uh, roadmap. 
So here we split it into a uh, design control and integration, but the, the areas that I'm really going to focus on um, is the integration aspect of it, um, because this is where we expect to see almost the biggest impact on the system. Um, and partly this is a sort of focusing on the functionality uh, to look at how we can uh, save space, uh, but improve the efficiency potentially of the charging of the vehicle. Uh, there's a lot of talk around vehicle to grid application and, and that becoming more of a, a using, uh, a sustaining, um, leveling out piece for the grid going forward. And again, improvement in, in this converter technology will help support that functionality. And then the integrated drive. So here, obviously, we have uh, the opportunity in terms of uh, enhanced power density, so uh, reducing cabling, therefore reducing weight, um, integrating the thermal management. So again, looking at optimization here um, and looking at the reliability um, of the power electronics will be with a challenge, uh, challenges around thermal uh, differences and challenges around warranty. Um, on that note, actually, and, and just as a as a side, I think one of the things around thermal management, which has been uh, interesting in discussions that I've been involved in recently, is looking at how we can actually convert some of the skills that we have around thermal management that have been used within, say, the combustion realms of engineering um, and looking at using those skills and that modelling application within other areas of the new electrified technology. So again, a great opportunity for transition of technologies, but also potentially for businesses that help support um, thermal management challenges uh, within combustion. Actually, is there an application that they can be using going forward um, or uh, design or systems design that they use going forward within that area that they can transition uh, towards some of the electrification technologies um, would be of benefit, obviously, to the UK. And we don't want to lose those skilled engineers working within our supply chain. Next, um, I was going to move on to the industry challenges. So after um, we produce the roadmaps, uh, we then looked at producing some industrial challenges. Now, part of the reason for doing these, um, as you can imagine, is that, you know, some companies will have an idea of where their strategy is and where they need to get to. Others might need a little bit of support and help to understand what direction they need to do go, go in. Um, so again, we brought together um, industry, academia and government to look at some of these fundamental aspects of it and really uh, work out where the um, technology uh, is going and actually what can be done uh, going forward in within the respective time frames. So moving on to the next slide. So this is how you would, for example, uh, read them. Um, all of these roadmap reports and the industry challenges reports, and they cover all the different technology areas. Today, I'm just focusing on power electronics, but we have them around electric machines, batteries, um, fuel cells, and also light weighting. Uh, so they are all available to download um, from the website. Um, the link is at the end of the presentation. But to read these, you can see on the left-hand side, the technology challenges there. There's then the examples of the research challenge. And then we've put the time horizon. So you can see there of where the developments need to occur um, to really have the game-changing aspect. And then in, alongside this, you can see um, where it is relevant to particular um, applications of vehicles. So again, we've broken it down into those one, two, and three um, that I talked about at the, at the start. So that very much cost-effective high voltage, the power density high performance, and then the high performance. So you can see uh, where within the vehicle segments um, the uh, application or the research is required to address some of these challenges going forward. As sorry, as I've just said, so they're directly linked to the indicator. So we've tried to keep um, the consistency there um, to enable uh, companies and individual consultants or organisations or academia to actually make use of uh, both the roadmaps, but then apply it within the industry challenges. So um, each of the uh, technologies is broken down into some key uh, industry areas. So here you can see it, and and if you click online on the website. This is a very much an interactive P PDF, um, so then you can click on the challenges and it will take you through uh, to one of those and, and you can see how you can make it applicable. Um, so on that note, um, the, I've, I'm going to go into the scaling up of the wideband gap man manufacturing, so you can see that on column two on the top. 
And so here you can see um, that it breaks it down there into various research topics um, and gives you the time horizon. So some of those earlier time horizons are probably more relevant to industry, whereas some of the longer time frames are probably around um, some of the industry uh, academic applications and the research that's happening. So, for example, uh, we know at the moment that manufacturing methods at the bottom there is a real significant issue. Um, and so how do we look at developing uh, both our manufacturing capability, our processes, uh, whether or not there needs to be uh, an improvement in say digitalization within that process to ensure that we have a consistency um, of what is coming out um, and increased level potentially of automation within the process to ensure that you have consistency with the end product. Um, so again, it means that you, you have that breakdown and you can really focus um, on your area of research and, and uh, the positive thing around this, I suppose, is that these have been shared widely uh, with the funding landscape that I, sh I showed at the start. So EPSRC, Innovate, um, Faraday and Driving the Electric Revolution, these are all recognised industry challenges and roadmaps. So again, when putting in proposals to these funding organisations, highlighting that, you know, these have been raised within this document um, is, is, is of, of benefit uh, if you want to submit uh, an application and hopefully secure some funding. So I just want to move on to a couple of case study um, examples uh, to go through to show you how um, at the APC we are really supporting uh, industry and what we're doing in terms of that collaborative research and development going forward uh, to see how we can make a difference. Um, so in our APC um, 12 project, uh, we had the ESCAPE project. So ESCAPE is end-to-end -end supply chain development for automotive power electronics. So this <laughs> excuse me, um, has, is looking at the development of um, silicon, looking at the development of silicon carbide uh, technology and looking at that real end-to-end -end supply chain. I think one of the key things um, that we've recognised um, on the work that we've done around power electronic supply chain is that the UK capability needs to grow. Um, we have a lot of um, expertise and innovation in terms of our academic communities, but actually looking at how we can pull through uh, the manufacturing and resilience um, of some of our businesses in the UK is something that we need to start to focus on. Um, and that is something that we've been working with at the OEMs, the tier ones and the rest of the supply chain to see how we can support and how we can develop it. Um, working alongside, I mean, for example, this, this project in, includes the compound semiconductor applications catapult as well to really take advantage of some of the capability that they have had put into place through government funding. And again, joining those dots to make sure that um, as taxpayers, we really get most value out of the asset for our business assets that we have within the UK for our businesses um, to help growth and therefore reduce imports, but hopefully grow exports. Um, so you can see here um, parts to sort of support um, epilayer growth um, and the silicon carbide manufacturing thing. So really looking at working with the tier ones and the OEMs to fulfill um, their capability. And again, I think that is something that we've seen um, over the course definitely of the last four years of a better alignment and integration of those OEMs and those tier ones working to wanting to work with their supply chain more closely to make sure that their products are fit for purpose but also they meet their um, requirements. I think um, importing some of the COTS items maybe uh, as we move this transition aren't meeting the requirements and of, of their specific um, specifications and so actually alignment uh, with some of those organisations and actually localising some of their supply chain um, is something that has come more paramount and I think definitely as well um, we've seen more of that uh, with the challenge over the shortage of uh, semiconductor chips and addressing how do we ensure that, that our manufacturers uh, have access to some of these materials that they need. So very much looking at building the ecosystem here in the UK to support them. Uh, the next project I was going to talk about um, is an APC 14 project. So this is called High Vibe, so High Voltage Integrated Battery Power Electronic Systems. Uh, the OEM involved in this um, is, is Jaguar Land Rover. And again, it's a great example of taking some of the great academic research that we have at the University of Nottingham, working with an industrial partner, um, Lyra Electronics, 
and Pectron to see how we can create the fully integrated uh, power electronic systems uh, for, for some of the battery, uh, assist, high voltage battery systems. And again, you'll remember seeing um, on that in terms of the component selections, uh, the component stream of the roadmap that actually this integration is something that is really uh, needed to help manage that system um, in terms of looking at how we can uh, manage both the power and the thermal management uh, operation of those systems um, to inform that the vehicle um, is uh, sort of becoming more efficient but more importantly it looks at how it can save weight by integrating those systems so the significant uh, weight saving uh, weight saving solution this is doing which as we know um, any sort of battery electric vehicle the batteries tend to be quite heavy um, so actually any weight that you can get out of the vehicle through other subsystems is a is something that is very attractive uh, to the OEMs and, and the manufacturers so again creating those integrated systems um, but traditionally this probably wouldn't have happened because that working relationship between academia industry and the OEMs might not have been in practice so again uh, delighted that some of our funding has been able to support this um, and hopefully it will, will, will prove successful. At the final project that I was going to touch on um, is APC 15. Um, and it, excuse me, it's a future BEV project, so uh, accelerating technologies for battery electric vehicles. Um, and again, this is about developing uh, the supply chain and um, BMW uh, UK and also BMW Munich are both involved in this in this work uh, again looking at how we can take some of those silicon carbide based power electronics and look at improving uh, the efficiency of our vehicles and meeting some of those targets and actually what's this this system and, and this project has done it's it's improving the um, overall efficiency of the vehicle again driving down the weight which as I've just said previously is a very important aspect when you're considering battery electric vehicles, um, but also enabling uh, better storage uh, within the vehicle and better storage within the battery due to that efficiency. But with the partners being involved and interestingly, the, you know, again, University of Warwick being involved uh, and the catapults being involved, looking at the skill development and that skills transition of both engineers um, at the OEMs, but also throughout the supply chain, again, is something that we're really excited about and supporting in terms of that grow, uh, job safeguarding and also creation of new skills um, amongst the workforce. Um, so just just uh, finally, uh, a couple of things that I was just going to uh, touch on um, before potentially I can take some uh, questions, if there are any, um, just to raise some. Uh, oh, hold on, to shut my octocue so I can't move my slides on. Uh, so it's just to talk about um, some of the latest funding competitions. So here we go. So the latest. Uh, uh, collaborative research and development program uh, is now open. Uh, so this is our APC 20. Um, projects can be anything. Uh, so it, the whole total package is around 25 million um, for this project. Projects raised from about um, 5 million up to sort of 15 million in terms of size. Some are at the larger end as well, approaching that sort of 20 million mark. Um, it's all it's all match funded. Um, there is an application briefing webinar that you can watch and, and refer to. The, again, the link is will be on the slides. Um, and if you want more details, you can contact us at APC. Um, and this is um, something that we obviously work with organisations. We have around three competitions a year, so it may be worthwhile um, logging on to watch the briefing to understand what is involved in such a competition, and then um, engaging with our business development team. So really, in terms of the, informate, the, the capabilities that we're looking at um, within here is um, thinking about um, battery cells and components and systems, um, fuel cells and associated battery plants, um, looking at how we can improve uh, the, 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 the integration between potentially electric machines and power electronics um, and improving the overall systems efficiency. Um, those sort of projects are, are the ones that we are looking for. Um, and I think, you know, one of the things that our business development team are very good at doing is bringing um, in some in some questions and some challenges uh, from other organisations and do introductions to other organisations as well who might have um, particular technology that would address one of the issues that you had. 
And then uh, the latest round of uh, our automotive transformation fund. So this is the one that I was talking about that is more around looking at um, capital investment and scale up. But we're looking here for uh, we've got 50 million pounds available. Uh, and this is where we're looking at um, helping businesses to scale up. So to validate their readiness to market for particular projects. Uh, so can you re-engineer a process to take it from small scale to large volume? Um, do you need to resolve a process or product issue um, that you've encountered potentially with previous industrialization products? Um, and also we can support uh, individual key processes, uh, both in terms of design and the manufacturing um, steps to complete that end-to-end -end process. So that is um, the current project serve. And again, there is a, a webinar online that you can um, watch or you can email us at atf at apcuk.co.uk. Um, so um, that's kind of um, it for my uh, slides. So thank you. Um, one thing um, I would just raise um, at the end is, is the stream that I, I didn't touch on within the roadmap is life cycle. And life cycle and sustainability is something that is becoming more paramount and more prevalent um, across all engineering sectors and across many businesses. And I think from a, in the realms of power electronics, it is a really uh, untapped area of research at the moment. There's very little insight and knowledge around life cycle. Um, and so I would um, recommend that any any of the individuals watching this who have, do have an area of interest in sustainability and life cycle to push forward with some of their development, um, because this is something that's going to change, particularly as uh, recognising some of the critical materials that are involved in the system, um, but also understanding how we can better uh, reuse some of the, the components within this within the control systems uh, to look at recycling them and remanufacturing them uh, because over time we expect that to become a, a more valuable commodity um, within the supply chain as as we expect that there will be green credentials applied to some of these systems so um, recommend people to also look into that area but um, my address is on the screen um, if anybody has any questions about anything that I've presented that they think of at a later date, I'm more than happy uh, to answer them then. Uh, but if there's no further questions, um, I will wrap up. So thanks for having me. I hope you enjoyed it. <laughs>